um, to speak about, and I'm sorry, let me pull up your title, Derived Categories of Hypercalar Manifolds via the Extended Mukai Lattice. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to speak in the derived seminar. It's a great pleasure. And also thank you for all the people attending. I see the buzzword the hypercalar manifold and the title uh, attracted some people. That is nice. Uh, so a disclaimer from the beginning on, uh, I will uh, throughout just assume that the base field will be the complex numbers. And uh, so to, to motivate the title and also what I want to say about today, let me quickly say something about uh, probably for all of you very familiar situation for K3 surfaces. So let us, let us consider the case that S is a projective K3 surface. And what we want to study today is the de bounded derived category. So the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on S. And so in the, in the situation for K3 surface is I would say probably rather well understood. So for a K3 surface, we can look at the following lattice. So a lattice, this is a free Z module and as a Z module, we just take the full integral cohomology of the K3 surface. And this has a, a critical form and this, I would denote this by B tilde and B tilde is the Mukai pairing. And just to quickly recall, so the Mukai pairing on the, uh, on the second cohomology, this is just the usual intersection pairing. And on and, and the fundamental class and the point class, they just pair by minus one by definition. And more, what is more, we have also on this lattice, we have a weight to hot structure, which is just inherited from the weight to hot structure, which we have on the second integral cohomology. And so, so therefore just the two zero part is the two zero part of the second cohomology, the zero two part is the zero two part of the second cohomology and everything else we declare to be of one one, of type one one. And so, and these two uh, things, so the derived category and this lattice, they behave, they have a nice interplay, and and that is some of the motivation for this talk today. And what I mean, so so by the works of, of mostly Mukai and also Orlov, let us consider the case that we have two. So we have two K three surface S and S prime, and we have a derived equivalence phi e, and so phi e is a, a Fourier Mukai equivalence by the work of Orlov. So E is the Fourier Mukai kernel. And so this derived equivalent then via the cohomological Fourier Mukai transform. So this is this what I denoted here below. This is this phi E and then H tilde. This is we take the Mukai vector of the Fourier Mukai kernel and then by the usual Fourier Mukai calculus, this induces us a, a Hodge isometry for this letter. So that means that respects the integral stru structure and it respects the, um, and, it, and it over C, it respects the Hodge decomposition and it respects the uh, quadratic form. And also there is, there is another case. So, so another thing I, I want to highlight because that is something what, what, what is our quest in this talk to find out, namely when we have this direct equivalence between 2K3 surfaces and this uh, Hodge isometry, these are linked by the Mukai vector. So, so we can take here from the, we can take for an object, we can take it Mukai vector. So which is just taking the trunk uh, character and multiplying it with the square root of the Todd class. And so that means that actually this uh, isometry is not only something which is just an abstract isometry, but also it relates these geometric properties of the element. So, so the, the Mukai vector of the element here under this isometry is sent to the Mukai vector of the image element. And so, so this is a really nice story. And also it is a, it leads to a lot of consequences. For example, it often reduces questions we have or we or studies we have about the bounded derived category of the, the K3 surface to the study of this integral lattice together with its hot structure. For example, uh, which K3 surface can actually be derived equivalent, how many, how do for Mukai partners look like, and so on. And so the goal for today, so what I would like to talk about is to find and describe a singular picture for hypercalar manifolds, so in particular for higher dimensional hypercalar manifolds. And so if there are no questions, then let me directly start with a, a quick a recall of hypercalar manifolds and uh, their cohomology and properties I need. So in this talk, X uh, will, will uh, be always you know, the projective hypercalar manifold, and I will abbreviate this with the letters HK. And so what does it mean? That, that means that it's a compact Keller manifold. So the dimension will always be to n. So if you see throughout this talk, any time and n, that, that comes from the dimension. So have a Keller manifold is a compact Keller manifold, which is simply connected. And the space of holomorphic uh, two forms is generated by a nowhere to generate two forms. And this is probably all well known. So let me just be quick. 
So on the, uh, for hyperkalem manifolds, as is known, the, the, the second integral cohomology, this has a quadratic form. So this quadratic form I will call B, and that's the Bouville Bogomolo Fujiki form. And this can be characterized up to sign by the property that if we take a class lambda in the second integral cohomology and we take its two nth power and integrate it, then this is the nth power of the Bouville Bogomolo Fujiki pairing up to a constant. So here there is a constant Cx, and this constant Cx is a positive rational number. This is called the Fujiki constant. And then there is just some term uh, depending on n. And so one can think of the Bouville Bogomolo Fujiki form just as an nth root up to constant of integrating the two nth power of an element. And so just, just a quick reminder, I mean, for K3 surfaces, what a, so for example, especially to, to recall what this constant is, okay, free surfaces, the Fujiki constant is just one, and the second integral cohomology as a lattice is just asymmetric to two times the negative definite unimodular lattice E8, and then three copies of the hyperbolic plane. And if we have a hypercalar manifold of K3N type, that is a hypercalar manifold, which is the formation equivalent to the Hilbert scheme of n points on the K3 surface, then also there the Fujiki constant is one, and the second integral cohomology, well, it has the part coming from the K3 surface, so two copies of the negative definite E8, three copies of the hyperbolic plane, and there is the one copy uh, uh, of uh, which corresponds to the exceptional divisor of the Hilbert Chow morphism, for example, in the case of the Hilbert scheme. Okay, and uh, so the second cohomology we saw, we see it we know it's very it's uh, intriguing and also very interesting invariant and so we can consider and look at the following so that's the Verbitsky uh, component and that is the subalgebra generated by the second cohomology so you know phrase it differently I can consider the symmetric algebra of the second cohomology which is which is with uh, with its natural morphism to the full rational cohomology. And that image I define to be the Verbitsky component. And uh, another uh, in, uh, thing which we will meet in, the talk, in this talk, and the good thing is we had uh, an interact seminar two weeks ago to talk about it so I can be brief, this is the LLV algebra. And so LLV, this stands for Loyang Galdon's Verbitsky Lie algebra. And although there was a talk, let me just quickly uh, remind you of what that Lie algebra is. So the Loyang Galdon's Verbitsky Lie algebra, this is denoted by GX. And that is the uh, subalgebra of the endomorphisms of the full cohomology, which is generated by all SL2 triplets of the form E lambda, H, and F lambda. And E lambda, this is the, for a class lambda in a second cohomology, this is the operator of cupping with the class lambda. And we uh, take consider the lambdas which have the hard left shift property. And hard left shift property means that if we if we concentrate so a hypercalar manifold, I said I have fixed the dimension to be 2n, so the complex dimension, real dimension 4n. So the cohomology is, is uh, has a symmetry around uh, the 2n degree. And so we want that if we take these uh, operators E lambda from 2n minus 2k to 2n plus 2k, that these um, morphism, that these morphisms, that they are isomorphisms. And so this is the hard left property, and H here is the grading operator that is on the space of uh, on the cohomology of degree two n minus k, and shall act by k times the identity. And uh, oh, I think actually minus k. Yeah, minus k. Yes. Um, and then F lambda, this is just a dual left shift operator. So F lambda would here go in the other direction and. Together they they form uh, as a two triplets, and then we just consider the Lie algebra generated by by um, all these um, by all these uh, elements. And I will come back to the Lie algebra in a second, but uh, the title were derived categories, and this is the derived seminar. So let me quickly go to derived categories of hypercalar manifolds, and also uh, explain why I actually defined the, this uh, Lie algebra. So, and here I start directly with the theorem of Lenny Tillman, uh, and that, that says the following. So let us consider two hypercalar manifolds, X and Y, and we assume that we have a derived equivalence between these two hypercalar manifolds. So phi is the derived equivalence. And then what, what Tillman proved is 
that there exists a natural Lie algebra isomorphism between the Lienga Lund Gorbitsky Lie algebra. So there's an isomorphism between Gx and Gy. And that, that also has the following property, namely that we know that, so in general, always when we have a direct equivalence, we can always, so the, the what I showed you in the beginning that we can associate to the direct, to the direct equivalence in the, an isomorphism of cohomology, this always holds true, of course, for the rational cohomology. And uh, so if we consider here this um, isomorphism and uh, this isomorphism is actually equivariant with respect to this Lie algebra isomorphism. So what does that mean? So I can take a class here in GX and I can uh, uh, act on it in, on this cohomology and then map, map over via the isomorphism uh, pi H or I can look at the uh, uh, image element on a Lie algebra isomorphism and map it over and then consider the action. And that diagram commute. And um, just maybe, uh, so, so maybe this does not seem so stunning at the beginning, but if we just recall how this Lie algebra was defined, I mean, this Lie algebra is defined for, with, uh, by two things. I mean, I use here the operation which is given by cup product and the other thing is the operation given by grading. And both are not preserved under, the, uh, under direct equivalences. So this isomorph, so this, um, this isomorphism phi H does not respect these, these two operations, but still Feynman proved that still these two Lie algebras are canonically isomorphic. And uh, so, so why is this helpful for us? So Sorry, uh, okay. do you mean that FG doesn't take E lambda to E, e lambda? Exactly. Uh, and uh, is it clear where, where does it take? Uh, or where does it come from? So the isomorphism. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Um, my question is what is FG of E lambda? Is it possible to say what it is? Um, so, I mean, how this isomorphism is constructed is we can construct a similar Lie algebra on Hoche cohomology. So basically, I mean, you can co consider Hoche cohomology and there you can also consider a Lie algebra in a similar fashion, namely you can define when has an element in the second Hoche cohomology, the hard Lifshitz property. And what one can show is actually that, I mean, in the case of a hypercalar manifold, um, the um, the Hochschild homology is the free module of rank one of, over the Hochschild cohomology. And Hochschild homology is why the Hochschild constant Rosenberg isomorphism isomorphic to the Joram cohomology. And so, what, what, how the proof is conducted uh, is that you compare these two Lie algebras and you find out that they're actually so that if you, cons if you extend this Lie algebra by scalars over C, what well, it turns out that these, the Lie algebra you have on Hochschild cohomology and this. Uh, algebra they coincide. Yes, but uh, in the end, uh, what is FG of E lambda? Is it possible to write down some closed formula, something like E something plus higher terms or? I think, I think not then. So, I mean, so you, you can just do this in, if you, I mean, if you know that, I mean, for Hochschild cohomology, this so that you know it because a, cl a class a, in operator E lambda for lambda in the second Hochschild cohomology is mapped to E a lambda prime, where lambda prime is the image of lambda under the natural isomorphism on Hochschild cohomology. But in this case, this is not clear. And this actually, so I will come to that, and that's actually a problem. So, so th this, is, this is more an existence statement so that we have this isomorphism but we actually do not really know what a priori. And somehow part of the motivation and part of what I want to do today is show you that how we can actually determine this isomorphism and somehow how we can make this more geometric. But at least for K3 surfaces, is it possible to do explicitly? Okay, K3 surfaces. Uh... I, I would have to think. I, I guess yes. I guess for k free services, yes. But out of, I mean, I would have to write it down. So I, I can, I, maybe I come back to that later if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. So and so, what was our motivation? So our motivation is, so for a direct equivalence between hypercalar varieties, we can always. So we always have a, that we have a natural isomorphism on cohomology, but this is this is this is the rational cohomology, and the space is huge. 
So well, what we want, we want somehow an analog analogous picture as in the case for cafe surface, where the, I mean, you have the full cohomology is rather small, but so we want to reduce now the, the dimension of the space we're looking at. And so this uh, theorem has an immediate corollary, namely that this isomorphism between the full rational cohomology, this respects to a Hodge isometry uh, of the Verbitsky components. So that is, we have, of course, here the Verbitsky components naturally inside. And uh, so, and this isomorphism just respects, so sends uh, the Verbitsky component to the Verbitsky component. And that just can be, that, that follows purely from representation theory because the Verbitsky component is an irreducible representation of the Luyenga Lund Verbitsky Lie algebra. And it can be, for example, characterized as the irreducible representation whose such structure attains the maximal possible width. And therefore, it must so this irreducible representation under this isomorphism must be sent to this irreducible representation. So we have done the first step. We reduce the dimension a bit. So from this this cohomology, so from the total cohomology to the Verbitsky component, but still, I mean, the dimension is still big. So for example, for K32 hypercalar varieties, this is still 324 dimensional, and doing bookkeeping on a 324 dimensional vector space maybe is still a bit too much. So so that, that's why I will now do a little bit of uh, representation theory background and a bit on linear algebra and, and bear with me and to uh, the, uh, introduce the extended Mukai lattice and also the main reduction we need throughout the talk. So there is the following. So the following theorem was proven by Loyenga and Lunds and also by Verbitsky, namely that the Loyenga Lunds Verbitsky Lie algebra, this is actually isomorphic to the special orthogonal Lie algebra H tilde, and so the H tilde is the extended Mukai lattice I want to introduce. So, so what is it? So here H tilde X is the extended Mukai lattice, and so just, just a word of warning, so this is called the extended Mukai lattice, although it, it is a Q vector space. So the word lattice just emphasizes the fact that we have a quadratic form. So as a Q vector space, what is it? We have, uh, we have uh, the second cohomology here, and what we add two extra elements, and these elements I will call alpha and beta. And so as a rational vector space, this has dimension B2, the second uh, Betty number of x plus 2. And there's also a grading on it. I declare the element alpha to be in degree minus 2, the, the second cohomology sits in degree 2, and beta uh, I declare it to have degree 2. And so what did I, I said? It's a um, um, it is a um, it is a quadratic space, so it has a quadratic form. So how? Let me define the quadratic form on the second cohomology. I just use the usual Bouvier-Bogomolov form, and on then I, I in the on alpha and beta, I just want to have a rational hyperbolic plane. That is, I just say that alpha and beta are orthogonal to the second cohomology. Alpha and beta have both self paired in zero. And as in the case of K3 surfaces, I, I say they have uh, they pair to minus one. And so basically, what I have done now, I have just defined what I know for K3 surfaces and I have done exactly the same. So also here, the alpha and beta pairs with minus one. So the extended Mukai lattice for K3 surfaces, this is just the rational cohomology, the full rational cohomology. Except, of course, there's, there's a degree shift, but that's just convention. And again, also as in the case for K3 surfaces, we have that the extended Mukai lattice this inherits a way to Hodge structure from the way to Hodge structure from the second cohomology. So there is no surprise here. The two zero part is the two zero part from the second cohomology. The zero two part is the zero two part from the second cohomology, and the eight and the H one one is the rest. Okay, and so as I said, so we want to so we want to make this corollary here above. We want to make this uh, uh, somehow. We want to use the theorem from Lyenga Lund's Verbitsky, so via representation theory, to actually reduce uh, that we uh, reduce our situation that we can study this extended uh, Mukai lattice and also make it a bit more geometric, so somehow to interpret it better. So what it actually means or, or does for us. And so, can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Why is it extended Mukha lattice? Why can't? Why don't you just call it Mukha lattice? Maybe it's a stupid question. Because, for example, for K-free and hypercalar varieties, I think, for example, what, so let's let if you consider a modular space of stable sheaves on a K-free surface, then you associate to that usually the Mukha lattice, and that is the second uh, That is the full integral cohomology of the K-free surface. Well, shouldn't we call it the Mukha lattice of the hypercalar? 
I mean, I, I think, I mean, the word extended yeah. here is just used to that you don't, I mean, if you would call it mucha lettuce, then you would have two things which would, could be called mucha lettuce. I mean, it's not, it's a matter of taste. What should be the mucha lettuce and what should have another name? So, so I mean, that's the reason why I also call it extended mucha lettuce, to not confuse it with the mucha lettuce you have from KFB anti calamine, of course. Okay, and uh, so so uh, so how does the theorem also work? So this how does this Luenga Lunds Rabitsky Lee algebra X on this extended mukai lattice? That that is easy. So let me just quickly show you. So we take a lambda again, the class and a certain cohomology, and if we use the operator E lambda, then this maps alpha to lambda. And uh, on a class mu in a certain cohomology, this uh, shifts again, of course, it has degree two, so it sends the element. To the Bogomolov pair, Bogomolov Fujiki pairing of lambda with mu times beta. And on beta, we act by zero just for degree reasons. And the grading operator, I mean, it, it does what it tells you the grading. So on alpha, we act by minus two, on mu, we act trivially, and on beta, we act by two. And okay, so, so now I, so the reason why I did this is the following. So as if we consider now this uh, Verwitzky component as an irreducible representation of the Lyangel and Verwitzky Lie algebra, then we can embed it as an irreducible representation into the following uh, uh, module over the Lie algebra. Namely, we can take the nth symmetric product of the extended Mukai lattice. And so, I mean, I, I, I told you here how, how does the uh, Lyangel and Verwitzky Lie algebra act on the extended Mukai lattice, and then there is a natural extension of that action on the symmetric product just by derivations. And so, and since it's an irreducible representation, this embedding is just uh, is by Schur's lemma uniquely given by a scalar. And so, I defined you. I, I just uh, uh, forced the fundamental class one to be sent to the element alpha alpha to the n times n factorial. And the n factorial is just a um, um, convention of scalars um, for the following reasons. Namely, this embedding psi is not, so, so this is not just pure representation theory, but there is more behind it. Namely, as I already said, so the Verwitzky component, this has a, a quadratic form, namely the Mukai pairing. So this is probably also well known. I mean, we take m elements in H2 and two n minus m elements in H2, and how do they pair? So up to a scalar, they just pair by we put everything together and integrate. And also on the some nth symmetric product, we have a, so if we have on the mukai pair on the mukai lattice, extended mukai lattice, we have a pairing, and then on the nth symmetric product, we have a natural pairing, which is natural, but but observe that I, I slip here in a, a CX. So this is here comes here comes Harper, I mean the geometry of the variety comes here into uh, the picture. So the, the maybe usual one you would find in the representation theory language would be without CX, but here I use CX, and the reason for this is the following. Namely, that this. Uh, Sorry, uh, yes? CX is what? CX was the Fujiki constant. Ah, okay. Huh? Okay, okay, okay. Yes, here. Uh, and what is B tilde? And B tilde is the pairing on the extended Mukai lattice here. Which on H two is just the usual Bouvier Bogomolov uh, oh, okay. form, and uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, oh yeah, that's the part. And so, so this psi, this really respects all the stru all the structure the Verbitsky component has. Namely, it is uh, so it respects by definition basically the modular structure of the Langer and Verbitsky Lie algebra, but also this embedding here is isometric, so it respects the periodic forms on both sides. And what is more, so we have uh, it respects the hot structures. So on the on the extended Mukai lattice, we have a hot structure, and so and some n is a tensor construction. And every tensor construction of a hot structure gives a natural hot structure. And so this psi also respects the hot structure. And finally, it also respects grading. So if we shift uh, the grading such that the fundamental class lies in degree minus two n, and the point class lies in uh, degree two uh, n, then this also respects the grading. So this psi really remembers all the properties we can impose on our um, on our Verbitsky component, and so therefore it makes sense for us to consider actually this this bigger space here, and for the following reason. So um, I'm sorry. Uh, yes? 
And is there somewhere Clifford algebra behind this? Clifford, uh, I'm not aware. So, so I learned this from Lenny Telman. Maybe he knows more about this, but I'm not aware that there's uh, some Clifford algebra behind it. I mean, you have a quadratic space, so you can always consider the Clifford algebra. And yes. th this product of B tilde reminds very much something related to Clifford algebras. I see, yeah. yeah I have not thought about this, I must say. So I, on the spot, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And so, and so, so now let, let, let me come back to the right category. So, so the following is uh, so the following summarizes. So we have now this morphism psi, and we can have now the following picture. So let us consider x and y to the formation equivalent hypercalibre. And let us assume, and it's a technical assumption that n, so dimension was two n, that this n or the second Betty number is odd, and. Uh, so we, we consider the following case again, we have a direct equivalent between two hypercalar varieties. And then the following holds, there exists the unique isometry, Hodge isometry of the extended Mukai lattice such that the following diagram commutes. So maybe at first ignore this de determinant here. And so we have, so what I said before, the corollary of Telman, what, what, what does, it, did it, does it say? It says that derived equivalence induces naturally a, a Hodge isometry of the Verbitsky component. That was this phi SH. And so now we have, I, I defined to you the, for you this psi, these embeddings here. And so, and we have now in the statement now is that there exists the unique Hodge isometry which uh, such that this diagram commutes. And this determinant character, well, this is there because uh, in the case that n is even and b2 is odd, then uh, we, of course, there's the following thing that uh, vn equals minus vn. So uh, if n is even, and so therefore one, one twists this natural taking the n symmetric power by the determinant character to make this diagram commute. But I mean, feel free to ignore it for the moment. It's actually not so important. And so, so, but so this is now basically I I'm now I have now reduced the dimension to what I want. So I have so we have actually have that um, that a derived equivalence actually uses a Hodge isometry from something of dimension second Betty number plus two. And let me maybe summarize it also for in the case of outer equivalences. So. The, the usual picture is the group of outer equivalences admits the natural representation on the uh, on the orthogonal group of the full cohomology, and uh, so in the case of hypercalar manifolds, now we can restrict it. Of course, I mean this is now just punctured here because in general you cannot restrict, but the image of the, so all for all these equivalences, uh, the image in here we can actually restrict them to Hodge isometries of the Verbitsky component. And so the statement is there, there exists a unique actually factorization of this morphism such that the, we, these isometries in from the Verbitsky component actually come from isometries from the extended Mukai. And so basically, so I'm not, one could say, okay, now I'm very close to what I wanted from my goal in the beginning, but there is, so, so I mean, I think this is, this is a beautiful story, which was mostly developed, which was developed by Telman. But the, here, the, the statement here that it, it's the existence and uniqueness statement. So, in some sense, we what we currently have is, and that, that's what I want to why I wanted to stress this in the case of K free surfaces. There is now an abstract isometry of the extended Mukai lattice, which we associate to the derived equivalence. And somehow there is no so, for example, this this isometry. And uh, this representation here, this is given by using the, we take the Mukai vector of the Fourier Mukai kernel. So in some sense it's, and, and it relates the Mukai vectors of objects just, just as in the case of K3 surface. But here it's not, not at all clear first, what is this isometry? I mean, we just know there exists one. And also it's interplay actually with, the, with objects in the derived category or with, with the general cohomology. And so, and that is now somehow what I wanted to say and what I want to talk about for the rest of the talk, somehow that I want to add this 
linear algebra or representation theoretic statement with more geometry and with some and with and also in the end with an with an integral picture to it. So because we also up to now only talk about rational spaces. And so, and as in the case of K3 surfaces, we use the Mukai vector to relate these two pictures, and that's exactly what I want to do now. And that is, that is, I want to introduce the extended Mukai vector, which is also both part of the title of the talk. So let me define for you these elements Q to I in the Verbinski component. So these are these are cohomological degree for I, and they're defined by the property. If I take a class lambda in the second rational cohomology then I can uh, uh, cap these classes with uh, two n uh, with lambda to the power two n minus two i. And again, up to some scalar, and again here Cx is the Fujiki constant. This should just be the n minus i power of the uh, bovel bogomola fujiki form. So basically you can think of these q2 i's just as some powers of the bovel bogomola fujiki form. So for example, I mean, the, by definition, this q0 is just our usual fundamental class. Q2n is, is just the Fujiki uh, constant times the point class. When, for example, this uh, class Q2n minus 2, also again up to uh, the scalar of the Fujiki constant, this just gives us the Bovel Bogomola form. And so we have our nice, isomet nice isometric embedding of the uh, Verbitsky component into the n symmetric product of the extended Mukai lattice. And that's an uh, um, isometric embedding. And therefore, of course, we can consider it orthogonal split and that, that, that we denote by T. And then the following holds namely, and that is somehow a way to, which we also have to think about the extended Mukai lattice. Namely, if we take the orthogonal projection T of these elements alpha to the N minus I and beta to the I, then up to some factor, what, what we have is just that this class is, is just this, uh, this is, uh, a multiple of the of powers of the Bovel Bogomolov form. And also this I, I and somehow how how do, how one can prove this or somehow how much think of this. So I, I will quickly go up. Um, so we had the uh, extended Mukai lattice and so maybe this is not uh, very well motivated. So I mean this is more representation theory that it comes out that this Lie algebra is isomorphic to this. But somehow now, so one could ask how, how, how should one think about these extra elements alpha and beta? And somehow if we use our embedding psi, then what this uh, statement, uh, what this uh, uh, lemma here shows actually is that all these powers here are uh, project to uh, monodromy invariant classes. So what do I mean by this? So these alpha and beta, these are classes which are always hot, so they're always of type 1, 1, independent of the complex structure. The only difference they have is the grading. So what one, one has the grading uh, degree minus 2, and the other one has grading degree 2. So basically... I'm sorry. I, uh, yes? You said that alpha and beta are monodromy invariant classes, right? I mean... Well, the question is... In a sense, it's somewhat independent of the complex structure. They're always of type 1, 1. Yeah, but they are classes where? I mean, they are, they, that's what I wanted to say. So, I mean, uh, so also, I mean, my I, I, the question is somehow how, how should one think of this? And, and I'm trying to uh, motivate. So how I think how I think of the extended Mukai lattice. So the classes, I mean, somehow one could try in the case of K3 surfaces, we have the class alpha and that we can really think of as the fundamental class and the class beta. And we can think of this as the class of a point. And somehow it's such an analogous picture does not work anymore. But how we can how we how we can think of we can use somehow this this embedding of the Verbitsky component into here, and then we have here n plus one classes. I mean, we have the class alpha to the n, we have the class alpha to the n minus one times beta, and up to and up to, of course alpha times beta to the n minus one and beta to the n. And somehow instead of trying to think of alpha and beta is just one class and some are trying to say this alpha should correspond to this class in cohomology. What one maybe can do is one can think of these classes as, and one should think of all these classes simultaneously as the, as the powers of the bovel bogomola form and somehow just the, the, it, in the mixture of how many times I take alpha and how many times I take beta just tells you the degree. 
And that was what I wanted to say. And of course, the classes, and now if I project them, I get the classes Q2i, and they are, of course, they are really monotony invariant. So they, they are, I mean, these are honest classes in the cohomology and they are monotony invariant. So do I understand correctly that alpha and beta themselves do not have a reasonable interpretation, but monomials of degree n uh, of alpha and beta do have? Um, I think somehow, I, I, I mean, the monomials of degree n have a uh, reasonable interpretation for this representation. I mean, what I can, what we now could also do, I mean, you could try to, I mean, you can decompose the full cohomology and then every, um, and then every uh, irreducible representation also is a representation of this Lie algebra. And then you could try to also make sense of the elements alpha and beta in these representations. But that, I'm not trying to do this. I'm just trying to make sense of the classes alpha and beta in this ir irreducible representation given by the Verbitsky component. And then as you correctly said, then I, I think of monomials of degree n exactly as these uh, uh, um, powers of the bovel bogomolov form. And, uh, but I don't, I somehow, for a, I don't know, general degree 2n hyperkeller manifold, I think I, at least I don't know a, a way how to just say what the class alpha itself is. So I, I, I just, so I interpret these classes somehow just as a set of n plus one classes together. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And so, so, so where was I? So I wanted to define the extended Mukai vector. And so the Mukai vector has two, two ingredients. It takes the trend character and the square root of the Todd class. So therefore, I mean, so, so why am I doing all this? So we have here the orthogonal projection from the n symmetric uh, uh, product of the extended Mukai lattice to the Verbitsky component. And we have the same on the full cohomology. So we can take a full cohomology, decompose it into the Verbitsky component and an orthogonal complement. And I denote this orthogonal projection by bar. And so now the, uh, the main ingredient in, in uh, constructing such an extended Mukai vector is the following. So I, 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 the statement here is there exists a positive rational number Rx. I will define that directly up below the proposition, such as the following over. So I have here two uh, elements. I had take the square root of the top class and the full cohomology. And here is an element, uh, a linear combination of alpha and beta. I take its nth power and divide by n factorial. And so on both uh, sides, I have a projection to the Verbitsky component. So here, let me, I can project on this side, I can use the bar to project to project this element now. So now this is an element in the Verbitsky component. And on this side, I can project using my operator T. And the statement here is they agree. And so, and this is a priori, I mean, for me, when I first realized this, I was, I was, I mean, this is more, this is more an observation. I will shortly say something about the proof, which is merely a calculation, but basically it says that if we consider the square root of the top class as an element in the uh, Verbitsky component, there's just one relation. We, we can boil down all the relations between the churn classes of the tangent bundle by this one number Rx. So that it, here, basically it says that up to this, these orthogonal projections, uh, the square root of the top class is just the nth power of a linear polynomial. So there we can actually squeeze all the informations into this number Rx. And so of course I, I owe you the definition of this number Rx, but this number Rx itself, so it's so precise definition, which is given here is not so important. It's more important what is, what is the value in the examples. Let me just quickly say, so this consists of three parts. I mean, the, this, the second and third part, they just depend on n on the, and where to n was the dimension of the hyperkähler variety. And the, the first part, so Cx again is the Fujiki constant. And here I have this, this value C, which depends on the second churn class. And again, this, this value C depends on how, this, how the second churn classes uh, evaluates with classes from the second cohomology. So that is the, the definition. And of course, I mean, if I give you this definition, this does not maybe say so much. So let us directly go to examples. So an example, in, Okay, if we enter hyperkähler manifolds over uh, hyperkähler manifolds uh, deformation uh, in the de deformation class of over 80, 10 examples, this number is m plus three over four, and in the other known examples, it is m plus one over four. So I mean, this definition here does not have so much, but one can calculate it. Actually, it just uh, depends linearly on n, and this, it, 
And also, this also holds for n equals one. So for a K3 surface, this number really is one. I don't quite understand. Uh, I think the previous proposition defines Rx. So why do you call this a definition? This is rather a calculation. Yes, yeah, some okay. So some I, I mean that the proof. I mean the proof is basically I borrow uh, deep results from wozanski witten theory and apply them in this setting. So so uh, so this number here appears from. I mean one can define a wozanski witten theory. What is called the characteristic value of a line bundle and there are the, all of these constants appear. So so that's where those constants come from. And then basically, so that's so somehow historically these constants here were there before were there before. And I use them and actually realize that that in this new setting, this constant then helps to actually express the square root of the Todd class inside the Rabitsky component via this relation. But of course, I could also reverse the order and say some other. I can just make this next uh, existence statement and then later realize that this must be this number. And I also missed what is capital C. Yes, see, so, so so this is the constant depending the constant I associate to the second churn class of X, and that is I take the second churn class and I cap it with classes of uh, the second homology, and this is again this will be summable of the n minus first power of the Beauville Bromolo Fujiki form, and that constant I just call C or associated to the second churn class. So basically, I'm just saying this constant. I mean, this is an existence statement here in a proposition, but I actually I know the I know the constant, so I can write it down. And this is somehow it depends just on the dimension n. It depends on the Fujiki constant, and it depends on the second term. Okay, and so and now we have so now we have the square root of the top class. We were able to uh, cohomologically linearize it into this extended Mukai lattice. And so this now let, lets us allow to define the extended Mukai vector. And let me first do it for line bundles. So let L be a line bundle. And then its extended Mukai vector is the following. So its extended Mukai vector is will be always denoted by V tilde, V, v twiddle of L. And that is just, uh, I take one, uh, I take alpha, I take the first, uh, I take the first uh, train class of the line bundle. And then I take the I, I, at Rx plus the Bovil-Bogomolov self-pairing of the first churn class of the line bundle divided by two times theta. And that's an element in the extended book highlight. And so recall for K3 surfaces, so in K, uh, for K3 surfaces, we have that uh, Rx is one. So they are really, the, this definition boils down to the classical definition of the Mukai vector of a line bundle. And so, and the reason for the and the reason why this is so interesting and also helps us now is the following, namely the property I have above also holds, so that I can relate the this extended Mukai vector and extended Mukai lattice to the classical Mukai vector. So again, I can take the nth power divided by n factorial and project it to the Rubitsky component, and that is the same as if I take the usual Mukai vector of the line bundle and the full homology and project it. To the extent uh, to the Rubitsky component, and this property is what will help us later, uh, or which will which helps to understand somehow how this extended Mukai lattice and derived equivalences relate to the extended Mukai lattice. And uh, so, so just I mean, somehow why does this work? I mean, in general, there is just this statement behind there is that if you take Tensoring with a line bundle as, as an outer equivalence of the direct category, and you know by lambda the first churn classes, then this this is somehow this is probably the, the only thing which, without using this Mukai vector uh, definition, one can easily calculate. I mean, what, by, what I mean by this is that this outer equivalence has an action on the extended Mukai lattice, and this is given by the operator B lambda, and that's the same as the operator of uh, which is sometimes also called exponential of lambda or churn lambda for K3 surfaces. So it adds, so this element here is set to, there's just an alpha is, the alpha component is fixed. On mu, I have mu and R times the lambda. And then on the beta component, I have the S from here. I take, I cap lambda and mu and on the, and I take the R times the self pairing of lambda over two. That's also sometimes called Eichler transfection. And so basically from, from the proposition, this makes it immediate that this, this here 
that this, uh, using the fact that we know how transgene with a line bundle will act on the extended Mukai lattice, this makes it immediate that this holds. And this is this property. Yes? What's the question? Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> And this property is basically so. I, I mean, I, I, I will. I want to come now to derive categories and derived equivalences. But so I just want to say that in general, so the, this this property here, let me that I, I say that this an element E admits an extended Mukai vector if there exists such an, a vector in the extended Mukai lattice such that this relation holds. So that I can I take its nth power and project it to the Rabinsky component. Then it's the same as the projection of the of the usual Mukai vector to the Verbitsky component up to some scalar. And of course, I mean, well, of course, this is, I mean, this is not, not the real definition. I mean, there's there's a lot more going on. I mean, one one can one should fix one C in some on each class, and there are a lot of obstructions for ex existence of such a vector, and there are a lot of strong properties which hold for objects with with this vector, but let me just uh, let me come to derived categories uh, again. So because that was what I wanted to talk about in the derived seminar. So roughly what I have, where we have landed now, and is in the following picture that the derived equivalence between two hyperkähler varieties. So that we now can associate. I mean, there, there, are, of course, there are some grains of salt, a lot of grains of salt. We can associate to some objects now an extended Mukai vector in the extended Mukai lattice, such that this diagram, when we can define it, commutes and also some also up to a sign when uh, n is even. But so I should say that this is, I mean, it's of course not the, the perfect picture we had for K3 surfaces, but it's still, I mean, it's good I'm enough. Sorry, um, to, yeah? I'm sorry. I don't understand what is the relation of phi and E. Uh, phi and e, yeah, uh, e. Somehow, what what I'm saying is, let us, for example, assume. I mean, it's easier if n is odd. Then what I'm saying is, so so I can take e and I can map it to, and then assume somehow e admits an extended Mukai vector, and I can map it to phi e, and then I can map this. Where phi is what? Hmm? What is phi? Phi here is a direct equivalence. Ah, okay. Uh huh. And I can map this to its extended Mukai vector. So, uh, and I can map this to the extended Mukai vector phi tilde of E, and I can uh, map this element here to phi h tilde of V tilde of E, and it turns out they agree. Uh, do you mean that if uh, an object has an extended Mukai vector, then it's image under any auto, uh, exactly. under any equivalence also? That is exactly how one actually generates examples. So there are two ways to generate examples. The one way would be if you have an object in a draft category which has such a vector, and you take its image on a draft equivalence, then this object also will have an extended Mukai vector. So this property here, so basically the defining property here, this is invariant under draft equivalences, and also it's invariant on deformation. So if you have an object which has this vector and you deform it, then this, the deformed object will also have an extended Mukai vector. And that's basically how you generate more examples. And uh, for example, I can just also give more examples. So also how, how I generated these examples. So there's one actually other class I know of, and this is, I can take the skyscraper sheep of a point, and that is extremely easy using the lemma I had just above. So I did the extended Mukai vectors in this case is just a class beta. And so in that case, this constant C here from the definition, this is just a Fujiki constant. And that means the Mukai vector of the uh, skyscraper sheaf is just a projection of a uh, beta to the N divided by the Fujiki constant. And maybe uh, somewhere to show that, I mean, there is more than just line bundles and points, I mean, uh, then or um, uh, uh, skyscraper sheaf of points. Here's another example, which is a bit more sophisticated. So take a smooth rational curve on a K3 surface and then on the end favorite scheme, we have a, a naturally a smooth uh, Lagrangian uh, protective space. And actually this, it's um, structure sheep also admits an extended Mukai vector. And, and this, this formula is a bit more involved. So 
here if I take so and so this is again like the fundamental relation I need to for the existence of an extended MUCA vector but um, so what do I mean here so and here on the right hand side this class C I will later also come to um, hybrid schemes but the class C here uh, is, it comes from the, the part of the second cohomology of the second Hilbert of the, of the Hilbert scheme uh, coming from the K3 surface and here two delta is the class of the exceptional divisor of the Hilbert morphism that I will also define this later and then this equality actually holds so also in this case the, the information of the mu full MUCA vector of the structure sheet of the projected space projected to the Vavitsky component is uh, captured by this linear relation. So that here is a class in H2, and that just is the point better, and this relation holds. And there are there are some many more examples I know of, and or not, or not many, but there are some more examples. There are also examples uh, where I mean, and also non-examples, interesting non-examples. But again, so also due to time reasons, I would like to come to what actually does this give now us for derived categories. So basically, as I said before, we were not able somehow before this was an existing uniqueness statement, but now actually you just using this uh, the, um, this definition and, and objects we can find to have such a vector and the relation, we arrive already at the following result for, for general hypercalar varieties. So then X and Y be deformation equivalent hypercalar varieties, then we assume again that uh, uh, X and Y are derived equivalent. And here again, phi E, so if, if this equivalent is a Fourier Mukai functor, and E shall be the Fourier Mukai kernel of the derived equivalence. And so then, then there are basically three cases. So if the rank is non zero, then the rank is uh, restricted by the following numeric. So the rank of a Fourier Mukai kernel for hypercalar varieties always uh, underlies the following law. So it's of the form r to the n times n factorial over the Fujiki constant. And this number r is some uh, rational number. But actually, so for all known deformation examples, this Fujiki constant is integral. And then also this rational number must be integral. So for K3n type hypercalar manifold, every uh, derived equivalence which has uh, honest rank, this, this rank must be of the form r to the n times n factorial. So the number of ranks is already restricted, but it gets even more interesting if the rank is zero. If the rank is zero, then there are two cases. I'm sorry, uh, yes? uh, in this theorem, uh, you consider only K3 and type or? No, these are general hypercalar manifolds. Ah, ah, very interesting. And so, so this is, the, and, 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 and the, the ingredient for this proof are just the extended nuclear vector. And that's what I said. So the before we just had an existence and uniqueness statement. And now we actually, so somehow just because we can now make the, we can now make this uh, isometry, uh, this isometry here geometric. We understand what it does and actually what integral constraints there it must satisfy. We, we already uh, have this theorem. And so, and if the rank is zero, there are now two cases. The first case is that the support of E covers both varieties with Lagrangians. And this, okay, this may be not clear. So for example, if you assume that E is a coherent sheaf, so then, then this really says what, what I mean. So then basically what I mean, there is the, the support of, um, of all these sheaves EX for uh, X and X, then they are all Lagrangian. They're all really Lagrangian sub-varieties uh, sub and of they cover and, and similar for Y. And of course, if if our if the for a Mukai kernel is an honest complex, then what I mean by this, of course, then I say somehow again the, the support covers it. And uh, being Lagrangian is a cohomological property. What I say is that the class of the support, so the the, the highest dimensional. Highest dimensional class of the support is a Lagrangian class in H2n. So the support has a part in H2n, and that's that's its first non-zero part, and that is always Lagrangian. For do you mean do you mean here e is a coherent sheaf on x cross y? Oh yes, oh yes, you're perfectly right. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, and, uh, and by the class, uh, do, do do you mean the alternating sum of the classes of the cohomology of E. Exactly, so, yes. Uh, that, that, would, that would be how you would define it in the case for if it's known as complex. So they live in uh, co-dimension N, right? Exactly. Uh, to, to N. Yes. Uh, 
-hmm. So basically the geometry from this, uh, so the, the fact that we can actually squeeze so much information of the hypercalar manifold into the extended Mukai letters means we've, I mean, since we basically, we had three cases, we, we have three, three degrees in the extended Mukai letters. This shows that we actually can really have either something which is rank non-zero. If the rank is zero, then actually we have something where both sides are covered by Lagrangians. Or in the other case, and that's for hypercalar variety is extremely interesting, we already must have that the second integral cohomology is a Hodge isometric. And here I really want to stress here the Z. So that is that it's not over Q, but really over Z. And so and these are these are the cases we have. And so for time reasons, let me directly not go to the proof, but somehow go to okay, if we enter hypercalar manifolds, we actually stronger statements hold. Sorry, and in case B, do, do, do you mean that this isometry is induced by E in some sense? It's induced by E up to a line bundle twist. Uh -huh. So up to some, again, you need this operator B lambda or X lambda, and up to that, you actually have that, exactly, yes. Does it and this, the fact that it's integral, it really basically only needs the existence of the extended Mukai vector. But uh, does it mean that uh, the equivalence comes from an isomorphism? No, I mean, it's not even, I mean, this, I mean, the, as the fact that the second interior cohomology, the Hodge isometric doesn't, does not even imply in general that the hypercalar variety is aberration. I mean, ideally, somehow, if the monotony group is maximal, then you know that the, um, that uh, uh, that up to my up to minus identity that all these uh, isometry that that they are actually birational and then you would maybe hope that they're they are related by some kind of flops or I don't know but uh, I'm just saying that in this there are there are these three cases and and I'm just saying that in the in the last case the, the second entry cohomology is such isometric I have not more results regarding that in that full generality. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, due to time, uh, let me quickly go to K3N type hypercalum and to at least state the, what I, uh, the, the, the main theorem there. So, um, and because, I mean, I, I probably won't have time for the proof, but some of the proof, the techniques from the proof in the K3N case can be applied for the general case. So, so let, let me get X be K3 and type of manifold. So the prime example I already had that is a Hilbert scheme. So here we have the second cohomology, which has the part from the K3 surface and this extra part, part delta. And for a general hypercalar manifold of K3 N type, I, I fix an isometry. So basically what I do, I fix an I fix a marking because I want one uh, these uh, uh, fixed element delta of square two minus two n and divisibility two n minus two, and with that I can define now a lattice, so an integral structure mimicking the K three surface situation. Namely, I have the following. So I uh, uh, I, I define some just as the image of the I, I can just define extended Mukai lattice integrally. So I can take Z times the class alpha, Z times the class beta, and an integral cohomology, and take its image under this isometry. And this is the definition of lattice lambda x. And here below, there is an alternative description. Namely, I can define the element alpha tilde, which is the image of alpha under this isometry. So this is explicitly given by this element. And then actually, this lattice is really just Z times, as I said. So we have this element alpha tilde Z, and, and its Z span. Then we have the second integral cohomology and that times the class beta. And that is that is an uh, integral letter. So it, it has a quadratic form coming from the inclusion in a hot structure. And so, and this is theorem, uh, this here is the, the theorem in the case of K3N type here for Kalamorph manifolds, namely, so the first, so which all have the slogan basically that this is the letters which is fixed by derived equivalences and which uh, somehow, which is preserved by in the, for a derived category. and which then also later leads to a lot of uh, nice and strong consequences. So the first part basically, and that's how the proof is conduct conducted, is the statement that the, the natural or the representation we, I explained to you earlier, namely of the, uh, the from the derived equivalence group to the um, uh, to the Hodge isometries of the extended Mukai lattice, this actually restricts to a representation to the group of Hodge isometries of this lattice lambda x. And some of the relative statement of this is that if x and y of K3n type 
then a derived equivalence actually induces an hot geometry between these lattices. So that means the natural, this net, uh, the, the map here on the extended Mukai lattice just restricts to the integral structure. And taking the, I mean, these, these, it's the hot geometry, I can take the transcendental part of this isometry. And actually, the net, so the transcendental lattices of these um, the hypercalar varieties, this is a uh, derived invariant. So there's a hot geometry between the transcendental lattices in H2. And yeah, for time reasons, I'm not able to say something about the proof, but let me maybe just say that this leads to a lot of consequences and, and uh, for the derived categories, namely the, the numbers of Furimukai partners in the k 3 n type case that is finite. And it, it leads to description or um, a strong restrictions for Furimukai partners of moduli spaces. Some, I don't know, nice ready result for uh, Hilbert schemes. And also in sometimes the description up to find an index of the image of this representation. And uh, thank you. Uh, I'm already over time. I'm sorry for that. And thank you very much for the attention. Are there questions for Torsten? Thank you. Um, can I ask about last theorem? Yes, of course. Uh, so so uh, do you expect uh, the converse of the second part uh, to be true? So if you have an, a Hodge isometry between these lambda lattices, uh, does it give rise to a, to a derived equivalence? Some derived already say, I'm, I would, I would hope so. I mean, I'm, I, 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 I believe that there will be some kind of derived, I mean, basically this statement already shows that the number of Furimukai partners is finite. So basically one now just needs to find the right invariant which picks out from this, this finite number, which exactly occurs, which then bijectively gives the, the fact that for uh, derived equivalence, the same as Hodge geometry. I mean, somehow the proof, the proof. So what I, what I can say is that this is not, so in some case, so in some dimensions, this is basically the only lattice which is a derived invariant, but in some dimensions, this is not. So somehow there are different lattices inside. So, so if I view a lattice as a, full rank discrete subset in a rational vector space. There are even after scaling other lattices inside the extended Mukai lattice, which are left invariant by derived equivalences. But from my perspective, I, I feel that the, this lattice is the most natural one, especially because of the fact that this transcendental lattice remembers the transcendental lattice of the hypercalar variety. And I mean, I wouldn't, there probably to conjecture it, but I believe that there will be some integral structure which uh, somehow has this direct ready flavor. But if it's exact, and somehow if it is, I would all, I would guess that lambda x will be the best candidate for it. I guess, but uh, I cannot say more at the moment about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, maybe another question. So the the usual Mokai lattice uh, also is meaningful for. Uh, model spaces of objects. So uh, do you have some interpretation of your extended Mokai lattice for model spaces of objects in derived categories of hyperkeller varieties? I mean, does it control the dimension of, of the model space or something of that sort? Um, not that, I'm, I mean, that I, of course, I mean, I, I also thought about it and this is highly suggestive, I mean, the the existence of such a, I mean, I think there is a problem. I mean, a lot of natural bundles, I mean, the extended Mukai vectors is something extremely interesting. For example, no, no ideal sheaf actually can have an extended Mukai vector, for example. So, I mean, and, and for example, even the idea of weird somehow, the, um, which I was confused about, but sort of the first Hilbert scheme of a hyperkeller variety, is sort of taking the addition of the diagonal will not give you a Furimukai equivalent, basically by this obstruction. And so there are, there are only a few values for also, for example, the tangent bundle of a hyperkeller manifold of a k 3 n type when n is bigger than one will not have an extended Mukai vector. Mm -hmm. So there actually, this is, 
severely re restrictive and it's i mean it would be i mean basically somehow i mean does the theorem here say i mean if you have a derived equivalence of course you can always view you can just look at the image of, of the uh, skyscraper sheath and of course you basically would like that for some sort of stability these objects are stable and but some and basically the this method of the uh, extended Mukai vector gives you that what you, what you can have on the right hand side is severely restricted. I mean, the rank has severe restrictions. The rank is zero. Its support basically is a Lagrangian sub variety. So there are not so many options for it. But uh, I mean, it's moduli theory, I must say. I mean, that, that's, uh, yeah. I don't know more than what I said currently. What about PN objects? Do they have an extended Mukai vector? I mean, PN objects act trivially on cohomology, right? I mean, uh, two, two of your examples, like line bundles and... I, 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 I you mean, I, no, I see, so, yes. You mean, you mean the, not the Fourier Mukai kernel, but the, I see, yes. Yes, so, so there's an interesting, so for example, the, I mean, I mean, I know some examples and some non-examples. For example, the, there's this paper by O'Grady on modular sheaves and, or uh, for example, where he defined these modular sheaves and these are PN objects and, and these also have an extended Mukai vector. Mm -hmm. So for example, you have this natural uh, rank Two bundle on a final variety of lines of a cubic fourfold, and this is a PN uh, a P two object, and this has a extended Mukai vector. Yes. So this is an example, and what about non examples? I I, I actually well, I, yeah, I, I will. Yes, yeah, so in the case of a. PN object, probably it's maybe, I guess one could, yeah, one can speculate that there we always have it. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure in that sense, but uh, I guess for PN, opt, I mean, yeah, let, let me maybe better say, not the same word, but it's just, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a good, good question. Thanks. If, it, if, if, if you take the functor from the K3 to the derived category of a moduli space, and you look in, at an object in the image, does that automatically have an extended Mokai vector? Usually not. So for example, in the case of the Hilbert scheme, this, this, uh, uh, this gives you ideal sheaves. And ideal sheaves don't have an extended Mokai vector. So uh, for example, and uh, you can take a D sheaf of a divisor. That's a line bundle, right? And that that has a private. <laughs> uh, yeah, but 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 what I meant was somehow if you take the universal ideal sheaf of the Hilbert scheme, just as an example. Ideal sheaf of a point, you mean, or something? No, I, no. What I what I meant was to take the you you are here. I think there was there was. What Arvin asked. So, and you take some. If you take a point on the K three surface, and you restrict to to here, and then then what you get, you get some idea. You get some idea sheaf on the Hilbert scheme, and this does not have an extended Mukai vector. And do you expect some relation of this extended Mukai lattice to uh, Bridgeland stability conditions? I mean, also good question. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I think there are things which I would not say on the record for YouTube. But maybe, <laughs> maybe after I said tears in the gather town, I may, and after the first drink, I may be able to say more. <laughs> okay, good, <laughs> good answer. <laughs> so there, there was also this question whether the Markman-Mokai lattice is a derived invariant? 
Uh, how this does is it not compared to your lambda x. I I mean there are uh, some. It's as saying I can say the following. Yeah, no, this is not. So I know cases where the Markman Mukai lattice. So the so for moduli space, the Markman Mukai lattice is just the full integral cohomology of the K free surface. And there are cases where the uh, Markman Mukai lattice is Hodge isometric. But this letters lambda x, they are not Hodge isometric. So in that sense, I mean, I this is not a proof of the of a statement that this is not a derived invariant. But somehow I know that although there are hypercalar varieties which have Hodge isometric Markman Mukai letters, they cannot be derived equivalent. And that's just, I mean, that, that, that is some, you can look at cohomology. Basically, the reason for this is that we take a moduli space, then the Markman Mukai lattice does not see how coarse the moduli space is. I mean, a fine moduli space has universal family, and somehow to make it a, if, uh, to, to have a uh, universal family, what you would need is you need a, you need a Brouwer class and how high that order is. And basically, because somehow, you can view this lattice lambda x also as the integral extended Mukai lattice with a B field twist, but that, somehow that, that B field is of order two. And so if your Mukai vector is non-fine in the sense that the associated Brouwer class would have high order and you compare it to some moduli space, which has, which is fine, then somehow the lattice lambda, the lattice lambdas, they will not be Hodge isometric. And it will not be Hodge isometric anymore. Although, of course, I started on the same K-free surface. So the Markman Mokai lattice might be the right invariant for fine moduli spaces. Yeah, for fine moduli spaces, basically it's equivalent. So if you, if you have, I mean, some of our fine, I mean, for, I mean, or as, as, uh, if you have a K-free surface, then for two fine moduli spaces, the Markman Mokai lattice, I mean, the Markman Mokai is, 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 of course, yeah, well, what do I want to say? You know, I, I, yes, 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 no. So I, I actually also, so the following is true. If you take two K3 surfaces and you take two modular spaces of stable sheaves, which are both fine, then the lambda lattice is is Hodge isometric if and only if the Markman Mukai lattice is Hodge isometric. Are there other questions for Torsten? Does your theorem give you some like new interesting examples of, of Lagrangian coverings of hypercalar manifolds using this sort of second part? Mm, new examples, no. Yeah, I, 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 must say. I mean, basically, somehow, I mean, I know examples of, I mean, there's, there's a paper by adding Donovan and Meekin, where they, for example, construct the draft equivalence as a relative compactive by Jacobian. And somehow there you really see nicely this part A of the theorem, which basically says that the images of skyscraper sheaves, they really are um, supported on the fibers of the Lagrangian vibration. But I have some, I, I have not constructed new examples of derived equivalences in the case A of the theorem, which would give new Lagrangians. Okay, well, maybe let's let's thank Torsten again, and then people, if people have more questions, they can gather in the the gather town to ask the questions and maybe 